Hi everybody and welcome to the Sugar Free Show with myself, Karen Thompson and nutritionist Emily Maguire. Today I am a bit nervous but also incredibly excited to have one of my nutritional heroes and doctors, Dr. David Ludwig, on the show with us today. Now Dr. Ludwig is probably one of the most published, researched, amazing, amazing doctors in the field. Um, so for over two decades, Dr. Ludwig has been at the forefront of research into weight control. His groundbreaking studies have contributed to new understandings of the relationship between diet, hormones, metabolism, and body weight. Dubbed the obesity warrior, I love that, by Time magazine, Dr. Ludwig has fought for fundamental policy changes to support a healthier food environment. He's also a professor at Harvard's Medical School and School of Public Health. Um, and the director of the New Balance Foundation Obesity Preventi Prevention Center at the Boston Children's Hospital. Um, I mean, there is nothing this man hasn't done, right? So welcome, Dr. Ludwig. We are so excited to have you with us. Well, thank you. And uh, for someone who is sugar-free, that was an awfully sweet introduction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thank you so much. So you started your career in the 90s at the height of the low-fat craze and in your book Always Hungry you take on conventional wisdom, wisdom and do a great job of debunking ideas about calories and fat, right? So what led you to this point? Well, I began my career in, uh, I went to medical school in the 1980s and uh, I don't know about uh, Europe or, or South Africa, but uh, medical students in the United States get about a total of I think six hours of nutrition in their four-year curriculum, uh, which is of course uh, very ironic since diet and lifestyle causes most cases of chronic disease. But we focus on you know the drugs and the surgeries to manage the complications of mostly uh, an unhealthful diet. But my lack of nutrition background turned out to be a bit of a blessing in disguise because. I, I got into a basic laboratory, started doing research on genes uh, and biological factors that uh, affect body weight. Um, I became really fascinated with the problem, but realized that you know the obesity epidemic wasn't a problem with our genes. It happened too quickly. Um, and about the same time, I, in my own life, discovered that my weight was going up as so many people experience in their 20s and 30s, a pound or two a year. So I was right at the verge of being overweight, and this was in the mid-90s, when I started to think about nutrition in an entirely different way. Not, you know, again, fortunately I wasn't in, indoctrinated in the standard mindset through medical school, and instead began to think about calories, food, based on how they affect our hormones. I, I was studying as an endocrinologist, I am an endocrinologist, so um, became very interested that every time we eat, we alter our hormones, our metabolism, and the expression of our genes in profoundly different ways based on the nature of the food. I did my I first experiment on myself and found that uh, by uh, eliminating processed carbohydrates, doubling my fat intake, and making a few other changes, those 20 extra pounds just melted away with no effort to try to get rid of them. Um, it's just my body really wanted to discharge those calories. And that really convinced me to dedicate my career, um, both in the laboratory and in the patient care clinic, to a new way of managing this problem that will be more effective than the conventional calorie in, calorie out approach. Absolutely. Because I mean, that conventional, conventional approach to weight loss, loss focuses, focuses on the, on the calorie, calorie balance. So just eat less and move more. Um, and it's made out to be so simple uh, that if somebody can't lose weight, it's because they have a lack of motivation or discipline, right, in the olden days. Um, and we actually run a sugar addiction program, the first inpatient sugar and carb addiction program in the world, according to our knowledge, that, that uses the low-carb, healthy-fat approach in Cape Town. And one of the greatest things for the people that, that come in is that, that they start to realize it's not just lack of willpower. You know, something is introduced into the environment which is actually making them sick, fat, and addicted. Um, so could you elaborate on this, that we don't overeat because we're, uh, you had a lovely quote, um, uh, do you remember what yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah. Over, overeating doesn't make you fat, at least not over the long term. The process of getting fat 
makes you overeat. I now, love that. We, we, and that kind of, you know, kind of messes up the mind for a moment, but um, think about it. We know that if you cut back on calories, but you don't change what you're eating, and you particularly continue this very high processed carbohydrate diet, it's cer certainly sugars, but also refined starches, grain products, white rice, bread, potato products, all of these low-fat, high processed carbohydrate foods that flooded our diet. So we know that if you cut back on calories, yes, you'll start losing weight for the short term. But what's going to happen? The body's going to fight back. First, you're going to get hung progressively hungrier. And that's not a trivial thing. Hunger is a primal biological signal, highly, very difficult to resist. But to make matters worse, metabolism starts slowing down. The body goes into starvation mode. This creates a battle between mind and metabolism that most people are destined to lose over the long term. You know, I use an analogy like uh, it's like trying to treat fever with an ice bath. You know, if we thought about fever as just a problem of heat in, heat out, uh, then you'd say, all right, we just need to suck heat out of the body. So get into an ice bath. Now imagine you had a fever, you had a flu and a fever, somebody told you to do that you would be probably, you'd be very reluctant to do so. If you got into the ice bath, yes, you could temporarily break the fever, but your body's going to fight back. Severe shivering, blood vessel constriction, you're going to want out of there into warmer conditions soon. And that's the same thing that happens in obesity, except over a longer time frame. Your body fights back, and if you just cut back calories, um, you don't change that process. You only set yourself up for failure. So instead, we have to target the basic problem. The basic problem is that this diet that we've been eating, this low-fat, high-processed carb diet, has raised insulin levels and driven fat cells into a feeding frenzy. You know, insulin is the granddaddy of all fat cell stimulating hormones. You know, you could call it the ultimate fat cell fertilizer. When it goes up, when you secrete more, your fat cells are going to hoard calories, and when you lower insulin levels, the fat cells release calories. And so um, you can use that to treat weight problems much more efficiently. You eat in a way that lowers insulin, the fat cells open up, your body floods back with calories, uh, you feel much less hungry, your metabolism speeds up, and you start losing weight with your body's cooperation, not with your body kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I completely agree with Cara and Dr. Lovevig. I love the statement of the overeating doesn't make us fat. And I think that really now taking into this whole, you know, calorie isn't just a calorie kind of concept with it. And right at the beginning of your book, um, you have where you talk about your early research. So obviously you were very much, you know, working with animals and such in, in the beginning. And one aspect that I really would love if you're able to talk about it is this um, notion of the body weight set point. So, um, you know, we see in sort of um, rice, uh, sorry, rats and their mice uh, models that we see that they can compensate so if you overfeed them or underfeed them. So what relation does that have in humans, particularly when you're trying to lose weight? And does this have any impact even on weight loss kind of plateaus or skulls as well? Yeah, so we know that people differ in their tendency to gain weight. Some people can seem to eat whatever they want and never gain an ounce, but that doesn't mean that, it, that an unhealthful eating pattern is good for them inside. We could talk more about that. But, you know, other people, for genetic reasons or other, other uh, biological reasons, you know, have a tendency to gain weight easily. But we know that genes can't explain the obesity epidemic. They haven't changed. Something in our environment seems to be raising the set point that people's bodies are fighting to defend. You know, we talked a moment ago about how if you just eat less, your body fights back and tends to push you back up with mm -hmm. hunger and slowing metabolism. But the opposite also happens. You know, you think that you, if you overeat, you're going to gain weight. You will temporarily. But in the classic overfeeding studies, this has been done for almost a century, where people, you know, volunteers, are force-fed uh, with their permission. You know, they're told to eat 500 or 1,000 calories more a day. And, of course, they gain weight. But then what happens? They lose all interest in food. 
and their metabolism speeds up in the body's attempt to shed these extra calories. Once the force, and by the way, the people on the force feeding studies are as unhappy as the people on the starvation studies. Once the protocol ends, their weight naturally drifts back down right to where it started. So what we need to do, instead of trying to force weight down below a set point, it's like pushing an, a, an air balloon underwater. The moment you let go, it pops right back up. What we need to do is lower the set point, and then body weight just comes down in a natural way to that. And you don't lower the set by, point by cutting back calories. You lower the set point by changing what you eat. Um, we have a three-phase program in our book, Always Hungry. That's the name of the book. Um, but also, part of that isn't, it's beyond just food. We also focus on quality sleep, stress relief, and enjoyable physical activities because these help lower insulin and calm chronic inflammation. Those are, uh, we call it like a, a boot camp for your fat cells, but not for you. <laughs> I like that. That's a really, really good notion of putting that there. So, I mean, my, very, very similar, I had a very conventional training kind of from you know, my background within there. And the way I was taught was you know, the low fat mantra, it was, um, you know, healthy, balanced diet, etc. So, where do you think it all went wrong, or why do you think it all went wrong, and and how has it kind of got to this point that we're at now in, in nutrition science? Well, I think um, first of all, the calorie in, calorie out model is so inherently appealing to us, you know, and um, according to that model, you know, it's as you said earlier, it's just a question of willpower. It's your fault if you're fat. Um, that's resulted in terrible stigmatization, abuse. We, you know, we treat people very poorly with this medical condition because we think it's their fault in ways that we don't for other medical conditions. It disregards that body weight is more about biology than willpower. Um, to make matters worse, we got the low-fat diet, which also sounds so plausible, right? If you don't want fat on your body, don't put fat into your body. It's just all wrong. There is no evidence for it. Uh, as we now know, low-fat diets are among the least effective ways to lose weight. You know, uh, in, you know, there are some studies, many studies are be big behavioral studies where you put people, you tell people to eat this, that, or the other, and then see what happens to their weight. And mostly, those studies are negative. Nobody changes their weight very much. And we have this fall, false notion that diet doesn't matter, it's just compliance. But you can't change behavior easily in a toxic environment where people are surrounded with unhealthy food. There are some better quality studies where you actually feed people specifically low fat, or higher fat, different diets, and then see what happens. We did that, for example, in a study published in JAMA in 2012. Mm -hmm. We first brought the people's weight down by 10 to 15 percent. So their body would be stressed, hungry, metabolism would be slowing down. Then we put them for a month at a time on either a standard low-fat, 20% fat diet, a medium, rather moderately high-fat diet, like a Mediterranean diet with 40% fat, or a very high-fat diet like Atkins with 60% fat. And again, everybody was at the same weight, and they crossed over from one of these, each of these diets for a month at a time. On the low-fat diet, metabolism crashed. It dropped by about 400 calories a day compared to before weight loss. But when they were on the low-carbohydrate diet, um, it completely prevented that drop in metabolism. Their metabolism was running just as fast as it was before weight loss, suggesting that the body wasn't under stress and that we'd actually lowered the set point. So these are, this is a profound metabolic change. A difference of 300 to 400 calories a day is pretty much the whole obesity epidemic. And if you can change that, not even by, what, you know, by eating less, but just by increasing your metabolism, how great is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That paper, actually, um, I did my master's in obesity science, and that paper was featured very heavily in my thesis work. So um, <laughs> it's even more amazing to talk to you about it. But yeah, that, I mean, that paper was so kind of pinnacle to show that, yes, you can put someone you know, on a low-fat diet 
and a low carb. And sometimes they say, you know, quite often I'll get the debate from dietitians that you can get very similar weight loss, but when you actually look at metabolic, what's going on, once they've lost that weight, it's, it's so, it's, it's huge, it's massive. So the question aspect. is whether you, well, after, nobody, you know, nobody doubts that you can starve somebody and they can lose, you know, 20 pounds in a month. Um, but the question is what then happens? Are you going to spend the rest of the year starving, tired, un un unhappy, and then be expected to ignore your body's screaming signals? Or are you going to be, or maybe the weight loss will occur more slowly, even just a half a pound a week, but you eat as much as you want, snack when hungry, you feel great, and it's progressive. Your body just slowly drifts down to the new set point. It's, let, it's letting your body, not some ob ex obesity expert, determine the rate of weight loss that's right for you. We can't be outsourcing that to others. Let me just tell you, if, if I may, about one more study which relates to um, a topic you brought up earlier, which is like addiction. So we, um, we gave overweight um, men uh, one of two milkshakes. This was done in a double-blind fashion. The milkshakes looked the same, had the same sweetness. We adjusted the sweetness with a, an artificial sweetener. But in one case, uh, it had fast-acting carbohydrate, sugar, basically. Um, and the other milkshake was slow-acting, very slow-digesting carbohydrate, a kind of a certain kind of a starch. Mm -hmm. And so we gave the to these participants, again, each got both on different days. Um, we saw after the fast-acting milkshake that the blood sugar and insulin surged for about an hour and then crashed at about four hours. And at that time, we did brain imaging, a brain scan, something called functional magnetic resonance imaging. And we saw something pretty remarkable, that after the fast-acting milkshake, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens lit up like a laser. Every single participant showed activation of this area after the fast-acting milkshake, but not compared to the, the slow-acting milkshake. The nucleus accumbens is considered ground zero for reward, craving, and addiction. It's the part of the brain that is centrally involved in the classic addictions, like cocaine, heroin, alcoholism, you know, raising a very provocative idea of food addiction. Of course, we, we don't all... You know, we don't need cocaine to live. We need food to live. But perhaps these highly processed carbohydrates that are so quickly digested and cause a surge and crash in our metabolism may be hijacking these basic pleasure and reward systems of the body in ways that make weight loss extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, and that was um, something, because a line I really love from your book as well, I have a quote here, is, for many people eating involves constant swings from unpleasantly hungry to uncomfortably full, and that kind of brings into that aspect of the food addiction, and I think there's a huge, huge conversation that's going on now about sugar, and I think particularly in the UK, so we're now, there's lots of different taxis that are being proposed to put on sugar and, and such because of the, the properties of it. So in your opinion, and this might, you know, you can take us through your phases of your diet as well, but what do you think has to happen in the world of nutrition, particularly for not only to, to start helping um, treat obesity, but also prevention aspects as well. So your diet and all this hungry, can you just sort of take us through what a, the, the kind of good approach was, with it would be? Sure. Well, actually, let me just, uh, there's, that's the cover. Uh, you see, I love got, the cover. Yeah, you know, all the little, uh, it's like you ate a, everything bagel over it. Um, so, so the first phase is, um, so the first part of the book is the science. We want people to really understand the concepts. And then you can follow the meal plan that we've created or create your own, if you understand the principles. Um, in phase one, that's so the second part of the book we call the Always Hungry Solution. Phase one, uh, we ask you to eliminate for just two weeks all fast-acting carbohydrates, so all grains, potatoes, and added sugar. 
But the diet is really lush, rich, 50% fat. Um, so nuts and nut butters, full fat dairy, rich sauces and spreads, very dark chocolate, um, savory protein. So you don't miss the processed carbohydrate at all. It's like that milkshake study I told you. Your craving centers turn off. And we, the testimonials in the book, which are all authentic, show this. And people said, you know, before the first pound, before I lost the first pound, the first thing I noticed was my interest in these processed carbohydrates vanished. So you're, that shows you you're really making changes from the inside. You're not forcing calorie restriction on your body. You're changing your body from the inside. And then the rest happens naturally. So that's phase one. It's a rich, high-fat diet, but we still get to eat um, slow-acting carbohydrates, fruits, non-starchy vegetables, and beans. Phase two, we add back whole kernel grains and non-starchy vegetables except white potato. That's been hybridized to be make the perfect French fry, but it just digests much too quickly, so we uh, hold off on that. And then in phase two, you, you stay in phase two until your weight drifts down to your new set point. And you'll know that because the weight loss will slow down, you'll start becoming you know, interested in more food. Since you're no longer burning your fat, you'll need more calories in your diet. And that all just naturally adapts. You just follow, you eat when you're hungry, snack, uh, you eat until you're satisfied, snack when hungry, and you forget calorie counting. In phase three, we start to add back a little bit more processed carbohydrate because some people, especially after a few months of healthy eating, can tolerate a bit. And you know what? If you're at a party and your body can handle it, you know, go ahead and have a piece of cake. If you're traveling in Paris, you know, have the occasional pastry. <laughs> if your body allows it. Other people will find that just a little bit of that stuff triggers, gets them back, started on the cravings, hunger, weight gain. We have tracking tools to help people understand their body's tipping point. So if you're one of those people that just can't handle any, you'll be able to understand that and make a wise decision because having felt so much better, being free from cravings, being in control of your body again, will be worth much more than the fleeting enjoyment of these unhealthful, these, these foods that aren't so healthy for you. Let me just say the last thing I want to say is that the, the issue isn't just sugar. Um, of course, added sugar is, you know, major, major issue. But all sugars aren't bad. In fact, fruit is loaded with sugar. But fruit seems to be very healthy for most people. The studies show, you know, you basically, the more you eat, the healthier you are. Um, why is that? Because it's the sugars in, fruit, in a whole fruit are ensconced in the fruit structure. They're surrounded by fiber, and they're actually within the cellular structure of the fruit. So when you eat it, and even if you chew it, it takes the body a while to suck out the sugars, and so your blood sugar never rises very high. The sugars drip in slowly. You know, that's why beans, I mean, all carbohydrates break down into sugar, but beans, truly old world, unprocessed grains like wheat berries, uh, or quinoa, the like, you know, these release their sugar slowly. So it's not that all sugars are bad and all starches are good. Mm -hmm. Fast acting sugars are really bad, so anything that you add too much of, and fast digesting carbohydrates like white bread are. Uh, you know, are also bad. So we've got to stop thinking about food so simplistically as, you know, grain, good, sugar, bad, into a more sophisticated way about how these foods are affecting our hormones. Mm -hmm. So I would just okay. say, end it by saying a whole foods approach, you know, based on whole foods are going to solve the problem. You know, the, the, the fruits, vegetables, whole kernel grains, if your body can handle them. But also, saturated fats aren't a problem in whole foods. Chocolate is loaded with saturated fat. Coconut is too. But these are very healthful foods. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, what is your opinion on the 2015 Dietary Guidelines? We actually have a question from one of the people listening in. USDA 2015 Guidelines that actually came out in 2016? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, you know. Some people say, "What is the metaphor? Uh, 
a camel is a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> Have you heard that? <laughs> no. A little, you know, a little piece of everything. Um, it's such a mishmash. You know, there's so much political um, influence and intervention, and it's also just still enmeshed in the old, old world thinking, in the old paradigm of thinking. The very first guideline is control your energy, your calorie balance. This is a delusion. First of all, if calorie, if conscious control of calories were so important, how did people manage to prevent massive fluctuations in their body weight before the very concept of the calorie was invented a hundred years ago? So, you know, it's kind of silly. And also, nobody, not even a somebody who spends their life in nutrition, a nutrition expert, uh, can accurately determine their calorie balance to within about 350 a day. You know, you need an elaborate technology to do that. If you're off by 350 calories a day every day in the same direction, you would go from you could go from lean to massively obese in five years. So it doesn't work. And to lead off the guidelines with this you know, assertion that you have to control your calorie balance, I think disregards a century of research. We need a much more sophisticated approach. Now, the one thing they did get right is by limiting um, sugar intake, added sugar, and they're also backing off from the limit on fat intake. So those are positive steps. But the guideline is still very much immersed in old paradigm thinking. Okay, thanks. I know we've got to end soon. I just wanted to quickly um, touch on the fact that your wife collaborated with you a little bit on uh, on the book. Um, can we just give a shout out to the special woman who's actually driving this? You're only yes. the face. We know yes. this. My wife Dawn uh, <laughs> is um, a gourmet natural food chef. Uh, when, wow. I, when I first met her, she ran a Whole Foods Culinary Institute in Texas, of all places. And um, so uh, this really was, a, you know, a great uh, collaboration, um, romantically and professionally. So she <laughs> oversaw all of the recipes and meal plans. Um, it was very important for us that the foods not just satisfy the nutrient targets, but they also satisfy your taste buds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. So I was just going to end by saying the book is phenomenal. So it is probably one of the best that I have read in a while with this kind of approach. Um, so, yeah, for anybody that's listening, definitely make sure you pick up a copy. Thank you very much. Uh, direct, uh, you may direct your viewers to my website if that's okay. It's uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. David Ludwig com. Dr. David Ludwig com. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. Twitter, and that is David Ludwig, MD. Um, yeah, everybody, I've posted a link on the in the chat room saying where you can buy the book on Amazon. You can download the Kindle book, the um, the audio book. It's absolutely phenomenal. We've also got three copies to give away, thanks to Dr. Ludwig's marketing team. So what you have to do is go like his Facebook page and share that post. So go on over to Facebook, go find Dr. Ludwig, and thank you so much, Dr. Ludwig. We know you've got to go. Emily and I will stay on and answer some questions, but you log off, and it was such a privilege and an honor to have you here with us. Well, let me just uh, thank, thank you. you for so your, much. And let me just thank you guys for your great work. You know, you're such passionate advocates, <laughs> um, and you're not just advocating. In theory, you've transformed your own lives. You're leading by example. And um, you know that you know that is a community that is a campaign we all need to engage in. We need to cre recreate the world a healthier place where the easy choice uh, is the healthy choice. And you know, congratulations uh, on leading that battle. You know, we've got Africa covered. We've got Europe. Uh, I and some colleagues will work on the U.S. And um, you know, once we have uh, all together ended the obesity epidemic. You know, then uh, we can all retire to some nice beach house somewhere. 
<laughs> Love it. Okay, let's do it. Yay. Thank you, Dr. Ludwig. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Bye. Dr. Ludwig. Bye. Oh, amazing. Shanks, what an amazing so good. Hi, everybody. We welcome, so welcome. Fun. Thanks for being part of this. Tanyana, Tanyana says, thanks for incredible pearls of wisdom, Dr. Ludwig. Wanda says, thank you. Flick, thank you. That was awesome. So great to see these wonderful doctors who are changing the health of the world. Guys, this mm -hmm. man is literally, and I think, Emily, you can make more sense of this, but he has published so many papers. He really he is, is behind the science, yeah. Hey? Yeah, yeah. Literally, I am. I even messaged you the other day, where <laughs> I mean, I am one of those people who absolutely adore the science, and I have um, a lot of my learning has come from Dr. Lovett's work. It's incredible. So anybody that's interested in the science, the papers that he has done comparing low fat to low carb is just incredible. And um, so I can always link some of those on the pages as well um but yeah phenomenal he so speaks such amazing sense so i hope everyone enjoyed it um, and one anybody, of my anybody, favorites. Oh, and the reason i actually stayed on there was a question um i'm just going to check the comments quickly from um uh, tayana question for a uh, doctor sorry he's gone he's got so many interviews karen and emily how would one speed up fat loss or weight loss with lchf if it is quite slow about one <coughs> month loss what foods would you eliminate or introduce so we probably need to know a little bit more before giving a very very specific answer but things i would say to look at one would be to definitely start keeping a note of what you've been having so keep a food diary if you haven't done that already quite often things like carb creep can happen so you can have a much higher carb intake without even realizing it could be the overall amount of food that you're having as well um, and this is something that i'm literally just finishing writing and um, today for our balancing 101 course is this aspect of um you know how much too much for example and some people i think can run away and think that just adding piles and piles of fat to your diet and that's the way to lose weight but that's not necessarily the case um, looking at things um, like dairy intake as well, that can often be the easiest way. So if you're having a lot of cream or butter, for example, in your coffee, um, you know, fat in liquid form can really, really bump those calories up. Um, and other aspects, other um, non-nutrition aspects of so things like stress and sleep, and I know Dr. Ludwig touched on that, and that is in his book as well. People very much downplay it, but those have really, really huge impacts in regards to and sometimes you just need to give your body that little bit of time as well. You know, kind of be a bit gentle on yourself. It didn't just all go on overnight. So um, just looking at the bigger picture with everything. So hopefully, as I say, it's hard just to give individual, but that's kind of a broad approach that I would take with it. Absolutely. And as Em said, we are running the Banting 101 course starting the 1st of Feb, where we're going to be going after everything. We're going to be resetting, redoing, just going back to basics. Um, there's going to be a lot of support, a lot of information. We've got webinars with world-renowned experts, Dr. C. Mel Hotra. We've got Dr. Anne Childers, who's a psychiatrist. We've got bariatric surgeon, Dr. Robert Sivers. And then we have Sweden's diet, Dr. Andreas Infeld coming on as Yay! well. So that is going to be spectacular. <laughs> and that's only going to be for the closed group of people who are on the course. So it's not going to be like this interview that we did for our Sugar Free Show. It's going to be only for the people on the course. So you can head on over to my Facebook page or Emily's Facebook page to check out the offer there. Um, Wanda wants to know, mm -hmm. would it be a good idea to count calories while following LCHF? Um, it's a bit of a controversial one with this because it's not necessarily you have to you know, count calories very individually, but it, it, calories will come into play. We do. Um, and particularly if you're someone that struggles with losing weight, if you're someone that has had a very, very um, experience with diet history, so you've cycled a lot with your weight, um, gaining weight and losing weight, then looking at your overall food intake, so the quantity as well as the quality um, that you would you definitely need to have a look at. Um, I also see Jack said, you may want to add fasting, so refer it, yep, so Dr. Fung, actually, I shadowed with Dr. Fung for a week in Toronto, um, he's a good friend of mine and Karen's, and we have actually had him on the show, so I think that's 
on our YouTube channel, isn't it, Karen? Yeah, can you can go back. Head on over, yeah. yeah. I'll post a link. Yeah. So we've already done the fasting aspect. Fasting is a hot topic at the minute. Um, some people maybe doing intermittent fasting, 16-8 window could be very good for other people. Long-term fasts maybe aren't necessarily the way to go. So don't automatically think you have to fast. That's just kind of what the message we want to put out there from from us anyway. So yeah, and I, I just want to um, on that point. You know, I suffered from an eating disorder, from anorexia and bulimia, mm -hmm. and and overeating and everything in my life. And when I tried to fast, it started messing with my head. Even though I had been in recovery for quite some time, um, it wasn't the best thing that I could have done for myself. So just be aware why you're trying to do it and whether you have the right, you know, headspace for it. So just check your motives as well. I would say. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, I think that's a very, very good point. But okay, guys, I'm just going to post the YouTube channel, and then if there aren't any other questions, we will be logging off until... Um, oh, what about Dr. Noakes? Alexandra wants to know is if he cannot attend any webinars, please send regards. Yeah, unfortunately, um, he can't attend webinars. He's, uh, he'll be in the middle of his trial. Um, his the trial here in South Africa, but uh, we have interviewed him as well, and he is obviously a great friend of ours. So um, yeah, but not not this time, guys. Unfortunately, sorry about that. Maybe in the future we can get him back on the sugar free show. That's absolutely. by popular demand. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. It's always amazing having you here. We're using a brand new platform called Webinar Jam, which allows us to interact with you guys um, by typing and allows you to interact by typing with us. Please follow our YouTube channel. We only have like 280 followers. We haven't been pushing it much. Do that. Also, go to my Facebook page to win um, one of three copies of Always Hungry. It really is phenomenal. Um, goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Bye.